Let's assume this magic ball of grass is a planet and there is no air resistance. This is our rocket, Hank. How are we going to get Hank to space? Obviously, we'll go up, because space is up. Wait a second, that's all the fuel, oh dear. Hank got to space, but gravity's still a thing. And it was still there when his fuel ran out. How can a rocket stay in space if it falls? Well, let's try this. We should send the rocket sideways towards space. This is George, our second rocket. If he goes sideways, he can still stay airborne even after running out of fuel. Isn't that great? Uh, oh. oh no. Okay, so sideways didn't work either. Maybe we need a little bit of both. This is Daniel, our third rocket. If he goes up and turns sideways following the curvature of the grass ball, he can obtain an orbit, and even out of fuel, Danny has managed to overcome gravity. Has he? No. Danny hasn't overcome anything. That's right, Danny. You've done nothing. It turns out Danny is still falling because of gravity, but he is moving so fast that the grass ball curves away before he can hit it. Danny will stay like this forever if his velocity doesn't change. In the real world, this means the satellite can float around Earth endlessly without having to burn any fuel. This is all great in itself, but why hang around Earth? There's space to see. There's planets, comets, asteroids, moons, and tons of junk everywhere. Junk absolutely everywhere to go see and touch and eat. I mean, with all this, who really cares about the Earth? What's an orbit? An orbit is a curved path that an object follows around a body, be it a planet, moon, or whatever, in space. There's lots of different types of orbits. There's low Earth orbits, geostationary orbits, highly elliptical orbits, decaying orbits, and those freaky deaky black hole orbits. And much more. However, most orbits can be classified as circular, elliptical, or parabolic. In a circular orbit, an object orbits a body with a constant altitude and constant velocity. These orbits are really easy to do math with. In an elliptical orbit, an object orbits a body with a changing altitude and velocity on a path in the shape of an oval. An elliptical orbit has an apoapsis and a periapsis. The apoapsis is the furthest point an object is orbiting a body, and the periapsis is the closest point. In an orbit, the closer an object is to a body, the faster that object will go relative to the body. So, an object moves slowest at apoapsis and fastest at periapsis. The average distance of the periapsis and the apoapsis is called the semi-majoral axis. This value is helpful when doing math. You can find your velocity on any complete orbit with this equation. V is velocity, G is the universal gravitational constant, M is the mass of the body, R is your current altitude, and A is the semi-majoral axis, like we saw before. Using this equation and the rocket equation, which is for another video, you can find out what orbits you can achieve with a rocket and how much change in velocity or acceleration is required for each change in your orbit. Lastly, a parabolic orbit is one that an object follows when it is on an escape trajectory from a body. In other words, an object will follow a parabolic orbit if it has enough speed to escape a body's gravitational influence or its gravitational grip. Hyperbolic orbits are a thing too, but they are almost exactly the same as parabolic orbits. Orbits are great and all, but if you want to have a different orbit, there are many different ways you can get what you want. First, there is a bi-elliptical transfer orbit. This involves two half orbits. Basically, you get an extremely high orbit, reach apoapse, change the periapse of your orbit by accelerating, and then correct that when you get to the new periapse. This maneuver seems a bit ridiculous, but it can be extremely efficient. And believe it or not, sometimes it is even more efficient to slow down a rocket and achieve a new apoapsis from an even lower periapsis. Second, there is a Hohmann transfer orbit. This is much more direct. First, you accelerate and change your apoapsis, then you accelerate again at the new apoapsis, giving you a new circular orbit. That's about it. Almost all transfer orbits are done this way or with gravitational assists. You can't effectively change an orbit by firing away from a body. This will change your radial. That thing. It's not effective or efficient, so don't do it. Let's apply this. Here's the Earth and here's the Moon. Right now we're orbiting the Earth and we need to get to the Moon. How are we going to get to it? Simple. In a straight line. Wait a second, that's not a path to the Moon, that's a cl oh, oh. All right, let's try that again and think in motion. Right now we're removing like this and we need to get to that. What direction should we move and when to get to that? 
You might think it's best to shoot for the moon when you're the closest, but that's not the case. It's way more complicated. If we fire our engines here enough, we will eventually make it to the moon, but the speed we'd have to be running at would send us sailing past the moon. If we fire our engines here, we can get to the moon much easier, and with much less fuel. Space Navigation Rule Number 1 If you change your velocity now, your position will be much more different in the future. If you change your velocity later, your position will not be as different. That's a life lesson and a physics fundamental. If you need to change direction to get to something in space, you can change direction with much less fuel the further you are from that object. If you need to get to Mars and are here going this way, you can burn for 10 seconds now, go right for it, or burn 100 days later for well over 10 seconds and still never get to Mars. This works on linear paths, so it has to work on curved paths. So, with this logic, if we burn here, we can get to the moon with the least amount of fuel. Awesome, we can finally do it. What? Space navigation rule number two. If you're going to go to space, know where you're going. If you know where you're going, know where that place will be when you get there. If not, you're either going to die or find something that would shock the world to its core. If you were alive to tell the world about it. Keep in mind that you don't need perfect timing to get to the moon in one shot. There are many other ways you can approach it. Also don't forget, if you set up an orbit to get to the moon, make sure that when you end up orbiting the moon, it's at a safe altitude and velocity. Aim to orbit the moon, not to make a crater. Space navigation rule number three, loot bodies. That's right, you can literally steal momentum from other bodies in space. Here's the moon, it's orbiting Earth, which we are going to leave. How can the moon help us? Let's start with the simple idea behind gravity. What goes up must come down. If something goes up at a certain speed, it will come back down at that exact speed at the initial launch altitude. This is the same for orbits. If an object is moving a thousand meters per second on one side of the Earth, it will be traveling a thousand meters per second when it reaches that same altitude on the other side. So let's say we have Stan the satellite orbiting the Earth with an orbit slower than the moon's. If the moon passes Stan close enough, it will slingshot Stan around itself and forward, giving Stan a much faster velocity than before. Since the moon was moving faster than Stan, Stan fell towards the moon, then around it and finally away from it. If Stan entered the moon's gravitational influence with an escape trajectory, he would leave the moon just as fast as he approached it. The speed Stan left the moon at, coupled with the speed of the moon, is how fast Stan would now be going around the Earth and possibly leaving it. Think of it like hitting a tennis ball. A tennis ball and a racket are both moving towards each other at this speed, and like the forces of gravity, the tennis ball bounces back with the same speed. To the racket, the ball came and left with the same speed, but to you, the spectator, you see the ball approach the racket at a speed equal to the sum of the racket speed and the ball speed. You then see the ball bounce off the racket at the approach speed plus the speed of the racket initially. Double the racket speed plus the ball's initial speed equals the final velocity of the ball. Stan was the ball, the moon was the racket, and you were the earth. That's how a gravitational assist works. Now, we can say, Stan just looted a body. This video was created with Flash and a cheap graphics tablet, made by Nick Morgan in October of 2015. With special thanks to Johann Strauss and Ludwig Beethoven for the beats.